Welcome to the Unexceptional Moms podcast. This is episode 26, and today we're going to be talking about disability etiquette. My name is Ellen Stumbo. And I'm Erin Lorraine. So we're just going to be talking about the things that people say or do that um, might be bothersome to people with disabilities or um, just might not be as as kind, but I want to give a disclaimer to this before we start, because first of all, I'm going to say we've all done something that offended someone, right? I mean, um, as parents, we didn't always have children with disabilities. I'm sure we've done these things. And so I would say to the person um, that doesn't have a person with a disability in their life, um, if you've done one of the things we're going to talk about, it's okay. This is, this is not meant to criticize or um, chastise people who've done these things. It's just to inform and educate. And on the flip side, I'd say if you are that mom or, or family member of a person with a disability or are a person with a disability, let's just remember to give some grace to people when they do say or do things that aren't preferred. So that's our little, our little disclaimer. It is. We are, both of us, Erin and I, we're able-bodied, so we're yes. not disabled ourselves. So we have had to learn a lot of these things, and some of those we're still learning. <laughs> we don't Absolutely. always get them. And sometimes the rules change on us, right? That's you know. Right. And we and were just so, talking about some of that, and we'll... Exactly. And we're going to bring so, it up. I think the ultimate goal here is grace. Yes. Education and grace. Remember yes. to give people grace. They're, people don't intend to hurt or offend. And I always look at a person's heart when I consider what they're, what they're saying or doing. And so along with that, we do have a freebie today and we actually have an etiquette guide with 15 of the things that we're gonna be talking about. So the, the goal of this freebie is that when you print it out, you can give it to teachers at school, you can give it to um, maybe p your church, you can give it to daycare people, whomever you can think of who could really benefit from having an etiquette guide. So you don't have to be telling them what's appropriate and not appropriate. You could just say, hey, there's this really cool guide if you want to look at it. So that's the freebie, the etiquette guide. And you get it by going to ellenstumble.com forward slash episode 26. And that's the number two six. So ellenstumble.com forward slash episode 26. So let's dive in. Let's go. Number one, don't push a child in a wheelchair without asking the child first and then wait for consent. And included with that, I would say, don't use their wheelchair as something to lean on. Yes. Yes. Please don't use the wheelchair to lean so on. So you've had this happen to me. Oh, yes. Yeah. And actually, I would say that's probably one of the most uh, traumatic and bothersome experiences that she has ever had. It's scary as a child to have some stranger come and get you. Mm. Just like you would not pick up a child. If you picked up one of my kids and I see you picking up one of my kids, I'm going to call the police. There's no difference when you push a child on their chair. Just because they use wheels to get around instead of their legs doesn't make it okay. And again, when you ask, wait until somebody says yes. Because Nina, till this day, every time she sees an adult with a disability in a wheelchair, she asks them, has anybody ever pushed you without asking? Mm. It's a big deal. Interesting. And, Interesting. I, and I would say, even if a child is nonverbal, always ask before pushing. Everyone can communicate. And maybe it's a look that you see that's a little bit of an approval, or at least have the decency to ask first. And if there's another family member or a parent, right. then they can say yes or no, because maybe they don't want you to push the child. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which I should say, my daughter makes me go to her class at the beginning of the school year to actually tell her friends that if she's using her chair, not to push it. So yes. it's a big deal. Yes, really absolutely. Deal. Absolutely. I'd almost say treat it like you treat their body. I wouldn't lean on someone and rest on them. Yes. Right. I wouldn't grab someone and walk them around. So, yeah. Yeah. So number two, don't touch a child without asking the child first and wait for consent. And this would include things like when people pat their head, 
either. It's really condescending. So people in wheelchairs, obviously this can happen to them because they're lower. But um, one of our friends also has a child who's a little person and people pat her head. It's condescending. So condescending. And again, that's happened to my daughter, Nina, and it bothers her. So now when we are going to a store in the car, she goes through, mom, if it happens again, this is what I'm going to say. Mm -hmm. And we even go through, this is what I wish I could say. And she knows it's rude. So of course we don't say it, but just getting out what she wishes she could say, but then talk about appropriate ways that she could say. And what she wants to say is just, please don't pat me on the head. I'm not a dog. Interesting. And I would add with this too, um, don't pick a child up and don't let your children pick a child up. Yes. So like Anya, for instance, is 10 years old, but she's very small. I don't want people picking her up. She's very capable of walking. If I pick her up, it's because I'm her mother and I'm yes. loving on her and showing her affection. No one else needs to pick her up, especially not children that can barely hold on to her. Right. And you've had that problem with Nina too, haven't you? Oh, yes. Yeah. It's just so little. Yeah. And it bothers her again. And at school it happens and Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Okay. Number three, talk to the child with a disability, not their parent or the person they are with. Even if you aren't sure with their communication, you know, sometimes people are unsure with Oksana because they see her in the wheelchair. Is she verbal or does she even understand me? Assume they do. Always directly to them, make eye contact, ask them the questions. So for me, Anya is actually my one who's less verbal. So if, if you talk directly to Anya and ask her a question and I know she doesn't understand you or won't be able to answer it, I'll go ahead and answer it or I'll help her to answer you, but you're speaking to her, talk to her. Yes, absolutely. And I have a lot of adults, uh, of friends who are adults with disabilities. And when I go out to eat with them and hang out, I can't tell you how many times it's happened before that people talk to me instead of my friends. Mm. And again, that's also very condescending. And even if a child, like you said, even if a child is nonverbal, even if the child can't speak back at you, just to acknowledge them as people, absolutely talking to them and making that eye contact. That's what really matters. And again, if there is a caretaker or a parent or someone next to them, they can answer for you, but your eye Mm -hmm. contact and who you talk to should be the person you're actually addressing or wanting to talk to or find something about that, you know, them. And along those lines, I had a friend who commented that um, people won't, respond to her son when he tries to talk to them or ask them questions. So it's almost as if he's invisible. So just be aware, be aware. They're people too. They're there. Right. Number four, do not ask for personal medical information and do not share that information unless there's consent. And what that mean, what that means is a lot of us have been in the situation where people say, what happened to her or what's wrong with her? I mean, basically they're saying, give me their medical information, which mm-hmm. is nobody's business. Right. Right. Okay. So let's discuss a better way. Okay. So for example, um, when a child really does want to know, um, as a parent, Ellen, how can we approach a family with a person with a disability and ask that question more appropriately? Well, I think first of all, we are in a very unique situation because I sometimes ask those questions uh, and maybe I shouldn't. And I think part of why I do it is because I have kids with disabilities. So Mm -hmm. there's sometimes that connection. And I usually, if I do that, like for example, if I see someone with Down syndrome, you know, because it's so physically obvious. There's like, oh, you have Down syndrome. Well, my child has Down syndrome too. Um, You know, I don't know how, I don't know how to answer that very well, because I think I'm at the point in life where I think if they want to share with me, they will. And it's none Uh of my business. And is my point to find out what their condition or disability is, or is my point to treat somebody else as a person and get to know them and be in conversation and relationship? Okay, so um, sometimes the the people that I have had say what's wrong with her tend to be children. So as a a parent, 
I want to encourage my typical children to approach someone um, and acknowledge them for something about them that doesn't have to do with the disability. And I don't mind if kids say, um, what are those on your legs? They're so neat. Or um, I'd love to have you come play with us. I don't know, something that just acknowledges them for who they are, not for what their disability is. Yes, yes, as adults. And I mean, you, you do bring a good point. If kids ask, it's different because they're learning. Yes. And I have, I have had kids say stuff like that, like, what's wrong with her legs, for example? Mm-hmm. And my response is that there's nothing wrong with her legs, but guess what? There's something really exciting. And I said, at some point, doctors thought that maybe she wouldn't be able to walk, but look at her, she's running. So it hopefully helps kids look at my daughter from why does she walk so funny which actually that's been asked before, Mm. to, wow, that's really amazing that she can do what she can do. So I do try to change the way that maybe a child could look at that. Now, when an adult asks, Nina and I have agreed, and I think I've shared this before, that if an adult asks, what's wrong with her? I turn to her, I pat her down, I said, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? I don't know, what's wrong with you? (laughs) Just to let people know, it's not an okay question to ask. Right. I mean, if I ask a stranger, if I just walked to someone, I said, what's wrong with you? I mean, I could get punched in the face. Yeah. Again, right. why is it that we think that there are exceptions on treating people with dignity and respect when they have a disability? Right. There shouldn't be any exceptions at all. Right. Um, so where are we here? Number five, always presume competence. And we sort of talked about this with the verbal skills. Um, always, always, always. Yes. Just. When a person, so I think this is seen most often when you're talking about someone who is wheelchair bound um, and people assume that that means that they are then intellectually disabled as well. Mm -hmm. Um, So don't assume that. Assume that the person understands you and can communicate with you and instead of assuming they can't. Right. And we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, communication in a little bit, but there's been so many stories of how kids who were nonverbal and who were Mm. presumed not to be capable all of a sudden found this way of communication that opened up this world of communication. And they're finding out these kids were not who they thought they were in their intellectual abilities. But Even with people where you do know that there might be an intellectual disability, for example, with my daughter, Nicole, I want everybody to treat my daughter assuming competence because there is a lot that she can do. Mm -hmm. So we should approach every person with a disability as competent. Mm -hmm. Um, So along with that, number six, talk to kids with disabilities in age appropriate way. So basically talk to a five-year-old with a disability, how you would treat a typical five-year-old, a 10-year-old with a disability, how you would treat a typical 10-year-old, a 15-year-old with a disability, how you would treat a 15-year-old, which also means no baby talk. Well, and I'm going to say here, um, you know, if you're, if this is a family member, maybe you know that's not appropriate, but we're saying if you don't know this person, you're just getting to know this person, the best thing to do is just treat them appropriately. Um, So, Anya is 10. We definitely probably don't treat her like a 10-year-old, probably because Anya's not ready to be treated like a 10-year-old. However, Oksana is 12, and we treat her very much like a 12-year-old, but we get so many, actually, kids, too, who go, hello, Oksana, how are you today? Oh, yeah. He's an infant. So mm-hmm. that, oh, that does drive me kind of crazy. Yes. And again, I have a daughter who is very, very, very bothered by that. And she has come home frustrated. Why do people treat me like a baby? I'm not. Yeah. I have been with her at school where kids who are even younger than her do the little hands on the knees and they say, hi, Nina, can I have a hug? You know, with that. And then when I'm there, she does like me to respond. I say, you know, she's older than you, so you shouldn't talk to her like that. Uh-huh. I do say those things, um, 
because at some point, you know, and, and sometimes people say, well, you might hurt the feelings of a child. Well, but that child is hurting the feelings of my child. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, at what point, um, who, you know, what matters most? I want my kid to know I've got her back. And I want my daughter to know that I am going to speak up for her and that I actually do think her feelings really do matter. And I've never said it in a way that's well, what you just said. Disrespectful. Yeah, not at all. Mm-hmm. What you just said very much came across as education mm-hmm. more than Which hopefully yeah. right. it would come you know, it would come across that way. And we've talked about the five stages of disability attitudes here many times. Mm-hmm. And uh, this falls under pity, which is stage two. And pity is the most commonly experienced disability attitude because it's also the most common disability attitude. And the thing with pity is that it comes across as niceness. So people think they're being nice. Mm-hmm. And it's done with good intentions, but on the recipient's end, which is a person with a disability, it's disrespectful, it's condescending, it's dehumanizing. Um, Ellen, can we say in there about the gifts? Because that is the pity Mm -hmm. attitude. Yes. We, I have been amazed at how many people will hand my disabled children free stuff just because they're disabled. It, it blows my mind. Um, and there's a number of issues with that. One, um, when Oksana was younger, she started to believe that she should get anything she wants because all she had to do was say, oh, I like that. And people would throw it at her. It, it, it amazed me. Um, and so we had to put a quick stop to that because then what would happen was when people weren't giving her stuff, she started getting really angry. Um, But the other thing is a lot of these kids have typical siblings that are continually being ignored while their sibling with a disability is handed anything they want. You would not believe how much it happens. I have had a woman take a necklace off of her neck and give it to my daughter because my daughter said she liked it. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. It it is. It is astounding. And that is pity. Oh, look at the cute disabled girl. Mm-hmm. let's give her something right it happens all the time yes well pity for example is when we go on halloween guess what nina because she's the cute kid in the wheelchair gets more candy mm-hmm. so all the kids get to choose one and sometimes nina gets a handful uh-huh. and i've had my oldest daughter say well it's not fair why does right. she get more because she understands she has a disability so what i mean yeah. really so what um uh, she's my sister and how, why does she deserve more? Right. You know, it, it, it makes the people who do it feel better, but yes. that's not accomplishing anything at all. So that, no. that is, that's part of the, the pity again, good intentions, but right. From the right. recipients end, it's not. Yes. Um, number seven. Okay. And this is when it comes to prayer. Um, mm. So it's good to understand And I'm going to revert to what adults with disabilities have said, that what people with disabilities want, and I would say as a family, it's true. I want acceptance. Mm -hmm. I'm not really looking for healing. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for acceptance. And I think we need to use discretion when we offer prayer. So if you want to pray for someone, ask, how can I pray for you instead of, can I pray for your legs or can I pray for your disability? And That should be what we're saying because we don't know what people need prayer for. We can't assume that people need prayer for their disability because they might, but they might not. And only pray for them if they ask you to. And again, we talked about this touching people. Um, I've had friends who are women who have had strangers, men come and lay their hands on their legs to pray for their legs. And I think if that happened to any of us women, in any social situation, and some man comes and grabs your legs like that, you will exactly. call, you smack uh-huh. them and you call the police. And there is no excuse. Again, you can't, you can't do that just because someone is disabled and because you're in a church. You can't. I mean, even well, if at church a man touches me in the legs, I'm still going to smack him in the face. And that goes along with this whole idea that people with disabilities need to be cured. So as a parent, I would say, don't assume that I want my child to be cured. I accept her and love her, both of them, exactly as they are, just like I accept and love my typical children just as they are. Mm -hmm. I don't need them. I don't need you to pray for their healing. I've got a lot of ways you can pray for them and for our family, but no, we're not praying for their healing. And I think that goes to to recognize that for 
many people with disabilities, their disability is part of their identity and they don't want to be rid of that part of their identity. Mm -hmm. So that goes with that. Yep. Okay. Um, do not use generalizations. So in, in other words, if you know one person with a disability, usually people use this example for autism. Like yes, if you know one person autism. with autism, <laughs> you know one person, right? And all of them are different. All of them are different. And I don't know if we have this on there, but along with that, I would say, um, don't make comments like, but he looks so normal. Yes. Or, but she, she can't have autism. She's so social. Yeah. Um, which I have heard many times. Um, those kind of things, when, when we say that our child has a disability, just trust us on that. Yes. Yeah. yeah that's exactly right. <laughs> and I encountered this even with, um, when Nicole was a baby, with uh, medical professionals, um, where mm -hmm. all I kept hearing was kids with Down, and the, it was the kids with Downs, and we're going to talk about um, language in a little bit, but, you know, kids with Downs, kids with Downs, and, I and not knowing very much, because I was still not a part of the Down syndrome community, I remember saying at some point, can you please stop talking about kids with Downs, and can we talk about my daughter? Mm. And it really kind of threw her off. But I said, I don't care about all the other kids. I just care about my kid. Um, and that's part of it. Yes. N just because you know one person doesn't mean you know everybody. And we're talking about disabilities, especially like um, cerebral palsy or autism that are on a spectrum. Yeah. So uh, just because you've seen one person with autism who's not social does not mean that my daughter doesn't have autism because she's social. It's a right. spectrum disorder. Right. Yep. Yeah. Um, so number nine, use preferred language and preferred language by the person with a disability. And if you are unsure, it is always best to use people first language. However, if you really are unsure, even with your kids, what the preferred language is, I would look at what does the disability community that my child belongs to, what is their preferred language? Mm -hmm. So talk about that for people who don't know what you're saying when you say preferred okay. language. Um, so preferred language. So there's people first language, which is you, the safest thing for you to do if you don't know. However, there is such a thing as identity first language. So for example, my Friends who are adults with disabilities, they prefer identity first language, not people an first. Example of that. So I say, for example, uh, my child has a disability, and they say I'm disabled. Mm -hmm. So again, it's the identity mm -hmm. piece of it. Or, um, I mean, it would be the difference between saying a child with Down syndrome or a Down syndrome child. Right. Right. Um, now, in the Down syndrome community, because there's really a lot of parent involvement um, mm -hmm. because of the nature of Down syndrome, we, and I do say that we get a lot of say into what the language is like, but for example, in the cerebral palsy community, um, I don't know very many adults with cerebral palsy who use people first language. They use identity first language. And this is also where the whole special needs versus disability falls. Um, I feel that as parents, we feel very uncomfortable with the word disability mm -hmm. because we think that it has negative connotations or it feels like there's ne negative connotations. And we like to say um, differently abled and, you know, whatever cutesy things that we like to come up with. Whereas we have a community of adults with disability who are very uh, open about what they prefer and they prefer disability. And if anybody has been reading, you know, my blog for a while or listening to me, I've really tried to make the switch from special needs to disability because I feel like oftentimes as parents, we do like to tell people what the preferred language we want them to use when talking to our kids. But are we willing to do that when we have a community of the people that our kids belong to that community, telling us, the parents, this is what we prefer. So this is where, in a, in a way we're tested, are we willing to listen to the people that my children belong to that community or not? Because I figured my daughter is going to grow up and she might tell me, mom, don't use the term special needs, it's offensive. Because mm. that's what her community is saying. So I feel like as parents, 
we would do well to listen what the disabled community is saying. And if you notice, I didn't say the community of people with disabilities. I did say the disabled community. So if we listen to what the disabled, disabled community is saying, we recognize there's pride in who they are. Mm -hmm. um, disability is part of their identity, and they do have certain words that they prefer over others. Now, all that said, I don't think nobody can tell someone else how they self identify. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, and I don't have a physical disability, so I can't self identify myself. But if I did, nobody gets to tell me what I should call myself. I get to decide what I want to call myself. And if I want to use people first language, or if I want to use special needs, disability, or whatever else. Anything that you is, can add to that? Yeah, this is where that whole idea of um, the rules change and yes. there has to be grace yes. in it. So this yes. is my fear, Ellen. My fear is that someone listening to this is going to be like, I'm just not going to call you anything because whatever <laughs> I call you, it's going to offend you. Yes, so, no, no. And I think that's where this, this whole idea of grace, this is, this is um, informational. This is educational. Take it, keep it in the back of your mind. It doesn't mean you're going to do it perfect. Ellen just right. said she used to use special needs. Now she's trying to shift that because she got more information. So again, we've all used, let me give you a wonderful example of this. I have a friend who was at a store with her daughter with Down syndrome and um, an elderly woman approached her to tell her how beautiful her daughter was. I mean, this woman just genuinely could see the beauty in her daughter and called her a mongoloid. Now, initially, there was a real shock to hearing that word. And then she realized, this woman genuinely sees the beauty in my daughter. And in her generation, the term they used was mongoloid. So yeah. rather than get all offensive and start, we don't use that word, that's offensive like a lot of people do today, she accepted the compliment lovingly because she knew where the heart was coming from and she had grace. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just think, don't be afraid to talk to people because you're afraid you're going to use the wrong words. No. And I think no. especially if you're a parent of a child with a disability, um, whatever you're using, you know, you're using and you're communicating, you know, I did an interview today and actually I used special needs a few times. And every time I said it, I cut myself, I just said it. I just said it. <laughs> So when I say is that it's a learning, it, yeah, it's just, it, it's a journey. We're learning. Sometimes what I'll do as a parent, one of the things that just kind of makes me crazy is when people say like, is she downs? Yes. I just don't, a bit crazy. I just don't like that. So what I'll say back is yes, she has down syndrome. Yep. I, I do. The and exact so same I, thing. I'm not chastising them, but I'm giving them the correct, the correct way the correct language to use yes yep. yep and i i feel like i do that quite a bit as well i don't ever go into the oh don't say special needs you should say disabled because that could create more of a like a well that's the thing we want, we want people that talking. connection yeah we want people talking to us we want them engaging um and if they feel scared to say the wrong thing, no one's going to ask questions. And then we haven't gotten ourselves any further in educating people. Right. Now, if you do have someone say, please use this language, that's a completely different Absolutely. Um, thing. So yeah, it's that whole idea of chastising people yes. for not knowing yes. what they don't know. Right. And I right? didn't know before I had kids with disabilities. Right. Absolutely. I didn't. And I st I'm still learning. I mean, I, I still say things and I have really good friends who are adults with disabilities who will message me or call me and say, hey, Ellen, you said this and hmm, this is why it could be problematic. And I go, oh, yeah. Well, thanks for letting me know. I have to. Right. But oftentimes I have to think about it and I have to process it because I don't get it. I don't get why it's problematic. And I have to really spend time because it's not immediate to think what are they saying? Why is it problematic? And do I really need to change? So, mm -hmm. you know, it's those things that we do need to wrestle with even as parents because we're yes. not experts. <laughs> right. You know, we're not experts in any way on, on disability. We're experts in our kids in some ways. Yes. Um, and sometimes even with our kids, we're winging it and we don't know. Mm -hmm. So it's Very parenting. True.
Very true. Okay, um, of, well, and we kind of touched on this a little bit. Avoid the terms high functioning and low functioning, the labels. Essentially, or another way to say it is how severe is she? Oh, yes, I don't yeah. like them. Yeah, so, um, and, and I would add to that with Down syndrome in particular, just because her facial features are not incredibly prominent does not mean she's higher functioning and vice versa. Right, right. But people are obsessed with how high or low functioning my child is. Right, because we're very obsessed. We're very obsessed with "quote unquote" normal. It's yes, like the the absolutely. closer you are to being typical and normal, the better you are. Because we live in a society that really struggles to accept disability. We want everybody to be as close to this what we call normal as we possibly can be, and then we start playing those games. You know, like if you're what's called high functioning, you're better off if you're low functioning. And hopefully we can eliminate that from our vocabulary. It's going to be around. Um, but avoiding it, it's good. And like you said, a spectrum, you know? Yeah. And having said spectrum. that, you know, if I'm having this discussion with a family member or, you know, something like that, and they need more information, then that's one thing. And I think what we're saying here more specifically is don't walk up to people that you barely know and ask how high functioning their child is. Oh, yes. You no. know? No. But I have some family members who've asked those questions and that's valid. They're family and they can ask those kind of questions and we right. can right. discuss a, the importance of the fact that it doesn't matter, mm -hmm. <laughs> and B, that her facial features don't determine mm -hmm. how intelligent she is. But yeah, that's not anyone's business. And it's people not. worried about that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Which now that you say that, usually when I talk to strangers about, you know, Nicole having Down syndrome, I've had quite a few people, again, people I don't know, say, is she high functioning? Exactly. They can't, why, why does, does that matter? matter? Why? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Um, so 11, no unsolicited advice. Please. And, we say, and we say that from the parent's perspective. Please. You can ask for your advice. Don't give it. You heard that a gluten-free diet is great for kids with autism. <laughs> we probably have heard it too. And maybe we've tried it. If you heard about this fish oil, that's great and makes, you know, all ailments go away. Maybe we've heard about it, but at this point we know enough from the medical perspective that we're going to trust what what has worked you know what's been researched for forever and when it comes to parenting um if you did not parent a child with the same disability as ours you are not the expert in parenting and how you think we should discipline is probably not a good idea because you're just telling us that you think we suck at it <laughs> Yeah, well, and, and this goes a little bit, what you're saying goes a little bit into invisible disabilities. Yes. There are a lot of children with autism, and you would never know they have autism, and they are going to have a meltdown in the middle of the store. Yes. So let's give some grace there. Yes, and that's also when we say, believe the parent. If the parent tells you that a child has a disability, a child has a disability. They're not making it up. No, no. Um, and the other thing I'd say here is I really don't want your opinion on the fact that I medicate my child. Yes. And until and you've had a severely mentally ill child, don't, I, there is no supplement on God's earth that is going to cure my daughter of her schizophrenia. I'm sorry. No. Right. And her medications make her a really pleasant, wonderful person who's able to live in our home and not in um, a residential center. So. Yeah. Right. And yes, that's the unsolicited advice. And, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, the, the last one, I think we're going to talk a little bit about what yeah. that can go. And, you know, along with that, um, don't negate a person's feelings or experiences. Um, when you're talking to a friend who doesn't have kids with disabilities, you know, and, and you hear that the parent of the child with a disability say, this is really hard. There's that, oh, my kid does it too. <laughs> that negates the experiences, which are very different. So it's a little bit of the unsolicited advice, but also the whole, my kid does it too. It, it's different. Or, well, at least you don't have to deal with. Yes. Yeah. X, Y, Z. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Then that negates those experiences. Um, no staring. No staring. It's just and, 
look, I'm going to be honest, that's a little hard for me too, because I just think kids with disabilities are incredibly adorable. All children are adorable. But because I parent a child with a disability, I see kids with disabilities and I'm like, oh, look, just let you know, look at her wheelchair. Oh, Oksana would love that. Or look, that little girl's Down syndrome. I should go invite, introduce myself to her mom. Or so sometimes I'm like, Aaron, stop staring. <laughs> but then you usually go and introduce yourself. Yes, so I do. Kinda, yes. yes, I do the same thing. Um, I'll say I love your wheelchair. Mm -hmm. I just, that color yes. is awesome. Yes, you know? we do that too. Um, and really, if you have kids, teach them not to stare as well. Mm -hmm. It's just the staring is rude. Um, 13, all forms of communication are acceptable and valid. Everyone can communicate. Yes. That's, that's pretty self-explanatory, yep. yes. isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, don't make comments about the child in front of the child unless you're speaking to them. Yes. I mean, I think about so often conversations about the child happen around the child, but nobody is actually talking to the child. Right. Yeah. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll turn to Oksana and I'll go, can you explain that? Would you explain that for us? Or what do you think about that, Oksana? And I bring her into the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, this actually happens a lot in the adoption community, too, with people coming in saying, how much did he cost? Right, in front or, of the child. Or um, is that his, you know, who's his real mother? Yes. You know, these kind of things that a lot of people in the adoption community are very bothered by too, the discussion happening around the child. Mm -hmm. And you know, and there are situations, um, even sometimes when we go see some of Nina's doctors or even Nicole's doctors, there are times that I think they don't need to be a part of the conversation I'm gonna have with the doctor. Like, I don't want my kid to very have to true. sit for that. Um, and very even for true. IEPs, I, I don't bring my kids to the IEP no. because they do not need to hear everything where they're struggling or not doing well. We had to bring um, Nina to an IEP and it was really hard on her. Mm. So that goes, you know, I mean, that's a, that's a good way of thinking about it, that there's conversations that don't need to happen in front of the child. And even if a child is nonverbal, again, because we presume competence, we presume that they understand everything we're saying. Absolutely. So try not to speak about them as if they were not there. What we do with doctors, because that's been a real issue for us, is um, I bring an extra person to remove her from the room so that I can talk to the doctor. Um, or I've even put headphones on her when I didn't have anyone else and put some music on um, so that she couldn't hear what we were saying. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have a doctor, her, psych her psychiatrist actually has her um, nurse pull her out in another room and give her something to do so she can talk with me and keep an eye on her for me. So that's... And when the discussion is something that can be uncomfortable for her, you know. Um, and then our last one, 15, is no parent shaming. And no, no parent shaming for their choices. Again, and you mentioned that, Erin. Yeah. If you, you, if you choose to medicate your child, it's nobody's business. It's because they business. don't parent your child. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, and it's all kinds of things. Shaming is just a big thing right now. It is in parenting circles. And then when you have kids with disabilities is, yeah. um, it's just, you don't discipline your child. Well, you don't have enough structure. Um, the medication that you're giving, you shouldn't be doing that. You should try this therapy that I heard was great. You should do the gluten-free diet, you know, whatever. Um, we feel like we can say it's not, I mean, that's parent shaming and it's not helpful. No, no. not really helpful for anybody. Mm -hmm. Um, so I mean, these are the, the main 15 things that we have for, for the etiquette guide, um, and it's going to be nicely packaged. So when you download it and you get it, you again, you can, you can just give it to anybody that you need to give it to. But there, there are a couple of um, things that were brought up when we asked on our Facebook pages. Um, they're not necessarily disability etiquette things, but I think attitudes tend to direct etiquette in some ways. Mm -hmm. So, um, something that was brought up by a couple of people, and I agree, and I've heard a lot of adults say, is that people with disabilities are not walking lessons or inspirations for the rest of the people. Yes. You know, the, the purpose of people with disabilities is not to inspire us. Now, as parents, we get to be inspired by our kids because we right. live with them. 
you know, right. all kids inspire me in different ways. Um, and, and sometimes I could look at someone and be inspired by what they've accomplished and how hard they have tried something. But oftentimes it's because, oh, you got up and got showered just like me. You're such an inspiration. Yeah. And again, it goes back to the pity. It's assuming that life as someone who is disabled is so hard and so terrible that surely the fact that they did it is a big deal when it's not. Right. Right. So um, I had a couple of other comments that may or may not fall under etiquette that I just wanted to point out. Um, um, I had one person who said that people comment on how hard it must be to handle the disability. And this kind of goes with talking in front of kids. We don't want our kids to feel like a burden. Absolutely. You know? mm -hmm. um, and then the other one I have is someone um, had someone say how lucky they were that they didn't have to walk or that they wished <laughs> that they had an electric wheelchair. Uh -huh. um, yeah, probably not the best idea. <laughs> wow. Um, there is no shame in disability. People with disabilities are not ashamed because of their disability. No. That's super important to keep in touch. Again, that's not etiquette. That's just disability is not shameful in right. any way. Um, and we had somebody talk about, and this is about, you know, someone's wheelchair is like their body that sometimes they try to squeeze between a wheelchair yeah. and they could tip over the wheelchair. Just ask the person in a wheelchair to move. Yeah. Or Excuse go me, around. Could you move? Yes, or go around. Yep. Yeah. So that's what we have. Yeah. Yep. So um, there it is. Yes. We have yeah. what? What am I going to ask people to do? You're going to ask them to leave a review. So now you did it. See? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're on iTunes and we're on Stitcher, and you can leave us a review. Um, and again, the disability etiquette, ellenstump.com forward slash episode 26, bright orange button that's going to say, yes, send me the disability guide, the etiquette guide, and then it's going to be in your inbox right away. Yep. So. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. We'll we only have next week. two episodes left two of the left. season, and then we're done until September. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.